we start with curves on the plane. So that's the simplest uh, object out of all of this, which we, which we have discussed briefly here. Curves, curves on the plane. So by plane, I mean, um, think of a, a geometric object which you, you can think of as this, as this blackboard extended to infinity in all directions. Okay? So usually, usually to, to help us navigate this plane, we introduce a coordinate system on it. Right? So that once we do that, every point gets a name. Because every point I'm going to have, it's going to have a coordinate, an x coordinate. Usually we call this x and y. Right? So it's going to have an x coordinate, maybe x0, it's going to have a y coordinate. Y zero. So we can talk about a point as being defined by, by these two coordinates. It's like the address of this point. It's a uniquely defined address. There's only one point which has this address. And conversely, for any pair of numbers x0, y0, you have a well-defined point. So that's, that's, a kind of a, that's a way that we will talk about points on the plane. We'll think of them in terms of their coordinates. Now, very soon we will learn other coordinate systems. We will learn other ways of representing points. For example, polar coordinates are coming up next week. We'll talk about that. But for now, we will think of points as being represented by, by their coordinates x0 and y0. So now we've learned how to represent points. Right? So for instance, let's say, let's say this is 1, and this is 2, and this is 3, and so on. Right? And this will be 1, 2, and so on. So for example, if you have a point with coordinates 3 and 1, that's this point. So that's the coordinate 3, 1. First goes the x coordinate, then goes the, the y coordinate. So now the question is, how do, we present, how do we represent a curve on this plane? And again, what is a curve on this plane? Well, it's something that I can draw with the chalk without sort of um, just moving once, you know, without um, uh, removing, removing the chalk from the, from the blackboard. So that's, that's a curve, okay? as opposed to you know, something which I would say a strip or, or something which I would not be able to do in one stroke. How would we represent a curve? And this is a very important question because already here you see the, the main tools for representing geometric objects mathematically. And that essentially, there are two ways. One is to write equations, and the other way is to parameterize, parameterize your object. So two ways to represent One is by an equation, and second is in, in parametric form. So what do I mean by representing by an equation? This is actually something which we have already, which I have kind of used implicitly in this discussion, because I talked about the graph of a function. And what is a graph of a function but a curve? If you look at this picture, you see that curve it is just like the kind of object that I'm talking about here. Right? And uh, it sort of goes without saying, after the single variable calculus, that a graph of a function in one variable is such a curve on the plane. Right? So in other words, let me erase this. So let's say one, let's call this one, and let's call this two. So for one, an example would be an equation like this, y equals f of x. In other words, it's, it's, it's a graph of the function f of x. So where's the equation? This is the equation. When we write this, we are imposing a constraint. In other words, we're not looking at all points x, y, but we're only looking at the points which have the form x0, say, for some x0, and uh, f of that x0. Right? So for instance, in this case, if f of x is x squared minus x minus one, Let's say if I put x0 to be equal to 2, say, then f of x0 is going to be 2 squared minus 2 minus 1, right, which is 4 minus 2 minus 1, which is 1. So that means that if x is 2, y has to be 1. So this point is, this point is going to belong to our curve. Okay? But this point, for example, will not. In other words, no other point with x coordinate 2 will belong to our curve, only the one for which the y coordinate is equal to, to this function f in which I substitute this value. So, so, so that's what I mean by imposing the equation. By imposing the equation, I mean considering just the points x0, y0, which have this special relation, that the second coordinate is a given function f, like this function, evaluated at the first coordinate x0. And so when I impose this condition, I get a curve. I get that, that curve we call graph of the function. Any questions about this? So graph of a function is a, is a simplest example of a curve in, on the plane. And it is also it is represented in the first form by an equation, which actually is a good time to talk about how dimensions change depending on how many equations and how many independent variables we have. Because this is, some, this is a point which I think could be confusing. So there is sort of a very important rule here. You see, I start with two independent variables, namely x and y. And I have one equation, right? This. I only have one equation. So the dimension of the object I get is the difference between the two. This is the dimension of the object that I get. So it is indeed a curve. And this is the general rule. The dimension of your object is the difference between the number of independent variables, which in our course is going to be two or three, minus the number of equations you impose. So here I start with a plane, so I only have two variables, and I have one equation, so the dimension is one. I get a curve. But more generally, I could start with a three-dimensional space, right? So if I start with three-dimensional space, this is something we'll do later, but I just want to use it by way of showing that the same formula works in much higher generality. If I start with a three-dimensional space, then usually we put coordinates x, y, z. So that's like our, the space of this, of this classroom. If I impose one equation, I will get two. So that's going to be a surface. If, on the other hand, I put two equations, okay, I'm going to get one dimensional object, which is a curve. So there's always this, this, this calculus, this simple formula. The difference between the two tells you the dimension. Okay, so that's the first way of representing. That's not the only way. Perhaps one more thing. Not all curves, not all equations look like this, right? It's a very special form of an equation in which on, on the left-hand side you have the variable y, and on the right-hand side you have something which is independent of y, just depend on x on the first variable. You can have equations which are not like this. And the simplest equation, which is not like this, maybe not the simplest, but uh, one of the simplest equations, is this equation. Do you know what this represents? Circle, that's right. So this is again one equation, which we write on two variables, x and y, and uh, the geometric object which it represents is a circle of radius 1. If I were to put here r squared for some number r, I would actually get a circle radius r. So what does it mean when I say that this equation represents a circle? It simply means that if on the plane I look only at the points x, y, which satisfy this equation, then I will just get the circle and nothing else. 
That's all I'm saying. That's what I mean when I say that this equation represents this object. So this is a very efficient way to represent geometric objects. You can represent uh, graphs like parabolas, like in this case, but you can also represent a circle, which is actually not a graph of a function. Because here you can't really express very easily y. You can try to express y in terms of, in terms of x, but what you get is y squared is 1 minus x squared. So you have to extract the square root. Right? And so it's not so nice. Um, first of all, there are two square roots, so it kind of starts looking ugly. There are other ways to see that this is not a graph of a function, but I don't want to get too much too deep into this. My point is that you can write equations more general than y equals f of x, and this way you get more general curves. And that's all about the first type of representation of a curve in, on the plane. We can represent it by an equation. But there's also a second way, which is equally important. It's not more important. And that's called parametric form. And parametric form has a very nice intuitive explanation. The idea is that instead of trying to find a constraint which x and y satisfy, like x squared plus y squared equals 1, we introduce an additional variable, which usually we call t, like time. And we think of the curve as being traversed by, say, a point or some you know, little object, a point-like object. And you can think of this extra variable, t, as time. And you just look at the position of this object on a plane as time goes by. So at the moment t equals 0, say it's here. At the moment, you know, one second is here, two seconds is here, and so on. But for, really, for, any, for every value of t, is going to be somewhere. So parameterizing this curve means introducing an additional variable in such a way that you can label all points which sit on this curve by some value of this additional parameter. Two ways to think about it. One is the time. So think of this as a trajectory of some point-like particle. And this, at each moment in time, it is somewhere. A second way, think of this as a kind of as a rope. So just this, you know, this wire, microphone wire. I can take, you know, I can cut a piece. And I can uh, uh, label, you know, I can say it's going to be one, um, one yard. And I, so for each point, I know exactly the distance from the one of the ends to this point. Right? So I parameterize this wire. And then I throw it on the plane. Well, I can't throw it because it's vertical, but I just put it here and I throw it like this. So now each point on the, on the, on the wire, which has a certain address, which has a certain coordinate within the wire, is going to be to map somewhere on, uh, on the plane. Right? So in other words, let me, um, let me, let me draw it. In other words, so here's my wire. So it's going to be, say, from 0 to 1. I could actually take as long as I want. But let's say it's only one, uh, one, one yard. So I can't really take more. So each point here has a certain coordinate, let's say t0. So let's say this point has coordinate t0. I will think of this interval as sitting on a line which has coordinate t. Now, I, I assume that it is completely flexible, like this wire, and I just throw it on this plane. Okay? It, what, what do I mean by this? Well, this point will go here, this point will go here, and each point, for example, this one, which I call t0, will go somewhere here. So t0 will go here. So this will be, more generally, this will be some a and b, if you want. So this will, a will go here, b will go here, and t0 will go here, and so on, right? But now, since I threw it on a plane, each of these points is going to have an x-coordinate, which will be some expression of t0. So this is zero, but it just happened to be here. But then we look at it and say, gee, this, this is a point on the plane. So it has two coordinates. That's called x0 and y0. But as t0 moves, as t0 moves here, these two coordinates are going to change. So this are going to be two functions of t0. So then what I do is I just write x is f of t and y is g of t. And where t is goes, goes to a and b. And that's, that's, that's called parametric representation of this curve. Is this clear? Any questions? So since, yes? Well, you see this? This has become this, right? It's like I take the piece of wire and I just make it like this, right? Now, on this interval, I have a coordinate which I call t, which goes from a to b. When I throw it on the plane, for each value of t, I'm going to get a pair of numbers, which are the coordinates, x0 and y0. But when t changes, or t0, when it changes, these two coordinates are going to change, depending on t, which I symbolically write as a function of t. For the first, I call it f, and for the second, I call it g. So I get this expression, okay? So that's the idea. That's right, I have two equations because I have two coordinates. But these are not equations in this sense, right? This was an equation which was a constraint. I was constraining my variables x and y and saying that they have to, I only look at points which satisfy this. And I was writing just one formula for, for this, right? Which, see, it involves only x and y, but no auxiliary variables. But here, I have an auxiliary variable, and by using this auxiliary variable, I write the first and the second coordinate as a function of, of this auxiliary variable. So it's a different way of representation. But maybe it's better to look at, at a concrete example to see how it works, okay? So the example will be, here's an example. Here's an example. x is equal to t minus 1, and y is equal to 3t minus 2. Okay? So this is f, and this is g. In other words, I have written two formulas just like this, but I have chosen some concrete functions f and g for it. Okay? The first one is t minus 1, the second one is 3t minus 2. So the question is, what does it represent? So you can just approach it in a very uh, basic way, in a very naive way, and you say, all right, professor, you told us that for each value of t, I'm going to get a point, and what these formulas tell me are the coordinates of this point. Right? So I can, we can just plot a few points, for example. So the curve is going to be somewhere. We don't know yet what it is. But what we can try to do is just plot some of the points. And so what we can do is we can just make this uh, picture, this diagram, which is my t, x, and y. Right? So let's say t equals 0, the point is going to be negative 1 and negative 2. Right? When t is 1, it's going to be 0 and 1. When t is 2, it's going to be 1 and, uh, and what? Um, 4. Now I'm getting much slower as time goes by. Okay, where should um, No, no, where should we go? Right. Is it one hour or one hour and a half? I'm just kidding. So, right, so I've got, I've got three points. I, I have found three points. Let's plot them. So for t equals 0, it's negative 1, negative 2. So this one, let's call this A. This is B, this is C, okay? So this is A. So we don't know yet what the curve is, but we already know one point on this curve. Second, second point is 0, 1. This is 0, this is 1. Right? So that's B. And the third point is when this is 2, and this is uh, 4. So I can make it a little longer. So 1, 2, 3, 4, something like this. I'm sorry, yes, you're right. I'm just checking if you're awake. 
and you are. Some of you are. It's good. Perhaps more than me. Huh? So, so this is four, and this is point C. Okay. So now it's tempting to say. So this has three points. It's tempting to say that the curve itself is like it's just this. Right. So far, it's just a guess. Right. It's intuition. Because in principle, it could be, could be like this. This point, all this curve, both of these curves share these three points. So, so for now, nothing, nothing. I'm not proved that this is, it is this line, right? So in other words, this is a, this is a useful tool, but it's very limited. It gives you an idea. It can help you to guess what the object is. But just by using this, you cannot prove. Uh, you cannot say for sure what the, object, what the curve is. To say for sure what it is, you have to use more sophisticated methods. Well, which in this case actually is not very sophisticated, but in general, it can become more complicated. So what's, what's the method? The method is you can try. There are several methods, but one of them is to try to eliminate this variable. In other words, to try to find the equation on x and y. So I gave you a curve now in the parametric form, which is number two, right? This is number two uh, representation. What you can try to do is to rewrite it as number one, a type one representation by an equation. How to do this? You can try to express this auxiliary variable t in terms of x or y, and then plug it in the other formula. Okay? So express t in terms of x or y, and plug in the other formula. So what does it mean in this particular case? Well, if x is t minus one, that means that t is x plus one. And now I substitute this into the second formula, and what I obtain is that y is equal to three times x plus one minus two, which means three x plus one. So the end result of this is that y is equal to three x plus one. So you see, we started out with a parametric representation, but we ended up with an equation like this, or like that, because we have been able to express y as a function of x. And now, of course, we recognize this because this is a graph. This is already a graph of function one variable. So to understand what this is, you don't need to study multiple variable calculus. It's enough to study single variable calculus, because it's a graph of function one variable. And what is it? It's a line, right? It's a line which has a slope three. And we actually, we actually see it. So, so the first guess was actually correct. It is a line with slope three. But this is a proof, because we reduce this problem, the problem of describing this curve, to something we already know. Because we know from the previous class that when you have a linear function, in other words, in other words a function which only involves x and the scalar, but not x squared and so on, and neither does it involve any more complete functions, then the graph is a line. And we can easily draw that line, because you know a line as soon as you know two points on this line. In fact, here we know three points on this line. So it's even better, because we can also test ourselves whether we've got those points correctly. Clear? Any questions? All right. So um, by the way, you can, so you can see the kind of interplay between a single variable and, and a, a multivariable. And it sort of comes a little bit of a surprise, because here it's really about the function one variable, and yet we have taken a graph which lives in two dimensions. There's a very simple reason for this. Even if we study functions in one variable, when we want to talk about the graph of this function, we have to talk not, not only about the argument of the function, but also the value of the function. So implicitly, there are two variables already. Once we start talking about functions in one variable, there are already two variables involved. One is the, the actual variable x, on which the function depends, but then there's also a second variable we can think of which represents the value. That's why the graph of a function in, two, in one variable actually is going to be a curve, which, um, which lives on the plane. So in some sense, you already have some elements of a multivariable calculus when you study single variable calculus. Okay. And likewise, when we will talk about function of two variables, a function of two variables to really understand them properly, we will have to introduce throw in one more variable, a third variable. For example, the graph of a function of two variables is going to be surface in three dimensions. Okay, so, so it's good to keep track of all of this. In other words, there are different things. There's like independent variables, there are number of equations, there are auxiliary parameters, there are uh, also graphs, which somehow bump everything dimensions all by one for the ending space. So it's important to keep this clear in mind. Like which, which are we talking about? Are we talking about function, or variables, are we talking about the graph of this function, and things like that. All right. Another example, a little bit more complicated, but basically the same in the same vein. All right, second example. This was one. This is example two. Okay. X is equal to t minus one, but y now is equal to t squared minus t minus one. Okay, I was going to t, so same idea. Again, express t in terms of x, x plus one, and substitute in this formula. Right. So uh, what you get is x plus one squared minus two times x plus one minus one x squared plus 2x plus 1 minus 2x minus 2 minus 1. And that's what? That's x squared minus 2 plus. So this is eliminated, this is eliminated, like this. So we end up with y equals x squared minus 2, which again is a graph of a well-known function, 